Hello, everybody. Welcome and thank you for joining. Um, and while people are joining, we're going to go ahead and um, throw up a poll. We're kind of curious to see both, um, you know, we're here to learn a little bit more about getting engaged in the planning process, but we also want to know a little bit about how you guys currently engage in the planning process. So um, I am going to give me one more. That's our first time doing polls. So thank you for all your patience as I figure it out. Um, but I am going to uh, start up our first poll. So while people put in their responses, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, thank you again for coming. Um, so just go ahead, if you're just joining us, to go ahead and fill in your response. We're curious to know how people engage with this process. Um, so today's session is part of our ongoing webinar series for the 2020 Old Line State Summit. And thank you so much to our speakers for being here with us. My name is Jessica Felt, and I'm the Preservation Initiatives Manager at Preservation Maryland. I just wanna get into a little housekeeping before we introduce our speakers. Um, we are going to be continuing to host sessions for the summit throughout 2020. Our upcoming sessions include one on the documentation and interpretation of underground railroad sites, and one discussing the process of creating a conservation district in Brunswick. And those, both of those are coming up in September. So we hope you'll join us for those. And more information and registration uh, for these sessions and recordings of our past sessions um, can be found at uh, oldlinestatesummit.org. Um, I also want to take a moment to thank our sponsors for their support of this program. Uh, Whiting Turner, the Maryland Historical Trust, Worcester Eisenbrandt, Brennan and Company, and the Middendorf Foundation. Um, our sponsors, along with the support from members and donors, make it possible to present these sessions free of charge, and we really greatly appreciate it. So today's session will focus on the issue of increasing participation in the planning process. Um, our speakers work every, with this issue every single day, so we are delighted to have them here to discuss it. Um, we are almost, if everyone can kind of get in their final votes, um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, close out this poll in just a moment. So do a little uh, five, four, three, two, one. And if you did not get a chance to mark your tally, um, uh, uh, that's okay. We've got more stuff coming up too. So let's just take a little look real quick um, and see. Uh, let's see. Share. So um, what we have here is that we have kind of a mixture. So most people, um, it's kind of a, a break. A lot of you here are usually facilitators in the planning process. Um, and then we have more that are not typically, uh, you know, another big group that's not typically engaged in there um, with kind of the smallest chunk here being um, presenters. So um, that is good to know. So our next question kind of expands on that a little bit. Um, one second, let's switch between them. Um, Okay, so the next one we want to ask is, um, since a lot of you are facilitators and uh, some of you are presenters, but um, for those of you who are involved, um, just let us know a little bit about what role you usually have in there. And while you guys are filling out that poll, um, I am going to go ahead and introduce our speakers. Uh, first, we'll hear from Stephanie Smith, the Assistant Director for Equity, Engagement, and Communications for the Baltimore Department of Planning. Stephanie has spent the bulk of her professional career working to advance environmental health and justice uh, through federal clean air policy. And as a former Congressional Black Caucus uh, Foundation fellow, she worked on affordable housing, environmental and voting rights issues. Stephanie is also a state delegate where she serves as the House Chair of the Baltimore City Delegation and is a member of the Maryland Bar. Then we will hear from Allie O'Neill of the Neighborhood Design Center. Allie leads the Community Design Work Program in Prince George's County, connecting interested professionals and motivated community members to complete a wide range of projects in service of their neighborhoods. Her architectural design background brings a unique perspective to her community design practice, um, which is rooted in particip participatory uh, processes and design justice. And we really appreciate both of you being here um, so much. So it looks like most people have voted. We're going to do just a little countdown for those last um, 
results five four three two one okay i'm gonna close this poll and i'm going to go uh, let's see present the results so this is about how you are usually engaged so it looks like we've got a, a pretty good even mix between community representatives and planners out there in the audience um, but we also have some architects. Um, we do have some people who um, come out to to view um, and listen, but maybe not necessarily um, present. And then we do have some that um, uh, submit written testimony. Um, so this is great. We were, as we were discussing this, we we're going to be very curious about um, the level of participation for everyone there. So this has helped us really kind of get that baseline. Um, so I'm going to hide that. And then we are going to, um, I'm going to turn this over to Stephanie now, and um, we will go from there. Thank you so much. Just give me one Thank second. You. Let me give you control. There you go. Okay. Oh, I apologize. There we go. Thank you so much, um, Jessica. I want to first give um, a special thank you to Preservation Maryland for um, providing this opportunity for me to share some of the things that we do and are trying to do um, at the Baltimore City um, Planning Office. And I also want to say, um, before she gets a chance to, um, to present, that um, the Neighborhood Design Center has been a great partner also in Baltimore City, in addition to the great work that they do in Prince George's County. And um, so I'm looking forward to hearing her presentation as well. So you guys know why, why you're here, so I'll move beyond this presentation slide. So just a quick overview of the three kind of buckets of information I want to cover. I want to discuss why, at least for our agency, having more intentional and really um, thoughtful engagement and um, interaction with the community and the planning process is really an outgrowth of some of the work we've done on our agency level to really think about equity in a more intentional and thoughtful way. And we know that it's very difficult to have an equitable outcome that does not integrate the input, feedback, and perspectives of those that are impacted by the decisions that we're making at our agency. So we'll, we'll give you a little context for um, that part of our work. And then also um, discuss one of our um, premier projects that's helping to prepare um, our community um, leaders to be um, um, even more productive partners as we are um, engaged in planning processes that are either in process or ones that are um, coming down the line or things that community members would like to see. So I'll discuss the Baltimore Planning Academy and what, and what that looks like. And then lastly, um, engagement exists along a continuum and there is an international um, association for public participation that really kind of um, unpacks the things that we as either organizations or the government or institutions, what we say and what that, what, what's the matching behavior that would have to correspond to what we're saying so that people realize, you know, you're gonna have to maybe crawl before you walk, before you run, and you wanna make sure you're managing expectations. So that'll be the last thing I, I touch on. Um, I think it's important just to um, discuss that equity planning is, is a concept and a framework that has existed um, for decades. And I think that in recent years, um, concepts around equity are, um, you know, reverberating across many sectors, not just, you know, planning or preservation. But I just wanted to um, put up, you know, this kind of working um, concept of what equity planning really is about, because in many ways, uh, historically, planners have often um, considered their primary stakeholders, um, government agencies, um, institutions, um, sometimes business stakeholders, and um, very often the most um, socially and politically, economically um, um, kind of deprived populations are not often historically consulted about decisions that may impact them. And I think equity planning is a framework um, that can cut across preservation, transportation planning, all types of planning um, to really make sure that you're not leaving any population out. Okay, so with Baltimore City, um, we've been thinking about equity and planning um, for a while. Um, many people, if you're familiar with um, Johns Hopkins um, University and particularly the medical um, campus in East Baltimore, you may know that it's undergone, you know, a lot of transformation over the past 15 or so years. And as that um, happened, you know, um, many um, households were transitioned out of the community. There were homes um, 
um, that were demoed. There was a lot of activity in an area that had largely been disinvested for decades. So in that posture, community members can feel like development in the land use system is happening um, kind of without them. And, and in many instances, um, community members would rather not be on the defense, they'd rather be on the offense about their land use future, but sometimes struggle to figure out the best way to have impact. So at that time, there was an East Baltimore Leadership Academy conceived just to really focus on those communities that were in that footprint. Because when you haven't seen a lot of um, land use activity for maybe 20, 30 years, and all of a sudden a lot of aggressive activity is happening, it can be really disconcerting even for the most engaged community leader around how to um, get involved. But at that time, despite it being geographically um, limited, there were requests from all over the city to participate. So that was, uh, I think, an early indicator that there was a thirst for um, more heightened understanding from community leaders. But at that point, the funding, well, you know, was geographically um, narrow. So um, as many people are aware, um, there was an uprising in Baltimore City in 2015. And that um, uprising was, um, you know, most closely related to the death of Freddie Gray in police custody, but it really was a culmination of lots of grievances and a lot of um, um, concern about what inequity really means on the ground for communities, particularly ones that are not close to downtown. Um, there, there's a feeling that their economic, social, and um, just, you know, general um, mobility was not being um, centered. So, um, our agency had already um, been doing some introspection around equity prior to the uprising, but the uprising only fortified and like, you know, doubled down the commitment that staff had because um, I don't know everybody that's participating today, but many people who go into the field of planning or preservation planning or transportation planning, they, they really care about cities, they care about people, they care about history. So sometimes they're um, working in environments from which they do not hail. You, you know, the, the opportunity to maybe work on these issues might be in a city that, that they're not from. So our, our agency wanted to understand equity in um, a general sense, but also in a very specific Baltimore sense. And why that's important to intentional um, engagement is that if you don't understand the context that the communities you're interacting with are rooted in, the historical context, the demographic context, the, the economic context, if, if that is missing, um, prior to your engagement, it can really undermine um, the value of the engagement because it's really hard to partner productively with someone that either feels not uh, unknown by you or not respected by you. And I tend to think it's very difficult to convey respect for something you don't understand or a person you don't understand or a community you don't understand. So um, we really want to make sure we understood what inequity meant in the very specific Baltimore context as we embarked on this effort. So I just want to um, quickly say that we have an equity and planning committee. They created an equity action plan, but one of the key provisions in that plan was about improving and increasing the dialogue between our agency and um, underserved communities. So I really will focus on that goal and objective um, through the remainder of my presentation. Okay, so um, as an agency, we developed um, an equity um, definition that really guides how we frame um, the purpose of our engagement with communities. And um, you see it right there. I think it's worth me reading, even though I know all of you know how to read. An equitable Baltimore addresses the needs and aspirations of its diverse population and meaningfully engages residents through inclusive and collaborative processes to expand access to power and resources. And um, it was very important to our team to have the, the phrase expand access to power and resources. Oftentimes people feel like, um, you know, government is, has decided for them what is best for them. And um, that is very dispiriting to enraging. And that does not make for the most productive collaborations between our, our planners, quite frankly, and community members. So when, when community members, particularly those who hail from historically, you know, disinvested um, communities, um, hear that you're really respecting the expertise they have as a community member that that you're bring that they're bringing to the planning process. It really makes it more fruitful. Um, but when you're kind of um, sometimes we talk about um, unconscious bias. Well, one of the ways that manifests is sometimes in, in a very paternalistic and um, <laughs> kind of um, really um, you know um, dismissive way that we're helping a community member without really giving them some type of credit 
that they're bringing expertise of the lived experience to the conversation and how can we honor hone and integrate that you know experience and expertise into what we're trying to accomplish together so um we also um adhere to um a, a equity lens that was um, developed by the Urban Sustainability Directors Network. And the reason why USDN's lens is the one the Baltimore Planning Agency is using is because the Office of Sustainability for the city of Baltimore is a, a division of the Department of Planning. And because we were one of the first cities in the country to have um, a sustainability director, um, we are part of that group of you know, urban um, sustainability directors. And this four part lens, I think is pretty easy to explain to people because you know, many people are aware of the structural inequities that we've inherited because the system was really designed um, to kind of determine, predetermine often whose voice is um, centered and, and valued and respected. Um, but procedural equity is where I wanna focus on a bit um, is because oftentimes you don't need a law to change or an edict or ordinance or anything like that to have your meeting at a time that would be more accessible to a community member, to diversify the platforms by which you engage people. I know COVID has colored a bit of that and maybe reined some of that in, but no matter um, what, even pre-COVID, um, I think it's important to diversify the ways people engage, whether it's in person, by phone, online, social media. The more options you, you give, the more varied voices you're likely to receive. So procedural um, equity really talks about um, how have residents who have been historically excluded from planning processes, how are they authentically um, included in the planning um, process? And I think in many ways where you're doing um, some of the in-person work is also um, something that you should be thinking about because um, space is not neutral. So where you hold a meeting, um, the history that that um, space um, may be presenting to the community, um, be it good, bad, you know, what have you, being conscious of that can also affect um, the quality of that conversation. Even how you set up the room. Um, some people, depending on how many people you're dealing with, maybe a circle would create a different energy dynamic um, so that everyone can see one another and no one's back, you know, is to anybody else. And it does, um, I think, evoke a more egalitarian feel to the, to the space um, where it's not like someone's on top of another person. Um, so that's where I think planners have so much flexibility um, when sometimes statute and other things drive what we have to do, how we engage with community members is largely up to, up to us and up to our understanding of our communities. And then um, distributional equity just really talks about how resources are distributed through a population. And in Baltimore City's case and Prince George's County and basically many you know, population centers, um, there's an unfortunate reality that residential segregation is kind of the norm. So when you're looking at distribution of power and resources, you can often rely on a geographic um, reading of that distribution and still hit upon a racial um, distribution of those resources. It's not a perfect um, one, but it's a very close, uh, you know, kind of approximate, um, um, uh, you know, get gaze on, on where power is being distributed. So um, for us in Baltimore, and I believe many um, communities and cities and counties have this um, shorthand, people I did something in East Baltimore, I did something in West Baltimore. I did something in Baltimore and then that's it, right? So the people in South Baltimore are like, no, never gone to talk to me or the people in some other part of Baltimore. And that is kind of the shorthand. So we have really tried to step back and be thoughtful about geography because you, um, depending on where you hail from in Maryland or even if you're coming from outside of Maryland to participate in this webinar, you may know that putting a meeting in a certain geography will severe, severely um, curtail um, the demographic richness of that meeting. So really thinking about like, you know, the geography, the transportation barriers that, um, you know, the could, could pose. I know, you know, in COVID, some of this might not matter, but, you know, pretty soon in your life, you may have to have these considerations again, and I want you to be thinking about them. And the last thing I'll just add is that transgenerational equity is really about, are we imposing undue burdens on the next generation of, um, of, of residents wherever we're working? And oftentimes, um, you know, people that have time to engage are sometimes um, people that are um, maybe in retirement, maybe they're able to work part time, you know, there's different features that can make community involvement a bit easier at different points in your life. But um, to really be thoughtful about getting maybe that under 40, under 30, you know, late teens, think about how you can make sure they're a part of these conversations because the decisions we make today, they're gonna have to live with in the next 20 and 30 years. So let me see, I'm taking a minute here. 
Okay, sorry. It may have gone. I want to go backwards. Hold on. Can I go backwards? Okay. So that's why we decided upon doing a planning academy for all of Baltimore, and um, um, because we realized that there was a thirst for knowledge. So um, instead of just kind of whipping up um, what we thought people wanted to learn about, we we actually did nine um, plug into planning pop ups all across the city, and we were very intentional about not focusing exclusively on neighborhood or community association meetings, but actually carving out um, opportunities for these pop-ups that were independent of like a pre-existing meeting. And the reason why that's important is that um, there is sometimes a difference in the joining culture of people under 50 years old. They can care very much about their community, but may not be inclined to join official bodies. So we wanted to make sure that if we had something, we, we'd invite community groups, but we also wanted people who were not affiliated with community groups to fill. That's why we had most of our, I think eight out of the nine pop-ups did not coincide with any particular groups, um, you know, meetings. And that's when we um, explained kind of what we do at planning. We also um, want to learn more about what do you want to know more about? Because as planners, we can have a much more fruitful relationship if we understand where some of the gaps are in the understanding of what it is we're trying to do with community members. So that helped us to, to develop the um, curriculum for the planning academy. And I, I wanted to lift up, um, we have a housing market typology that you know, really looks at the market strength of various parts of Baltimore City. So for applicants, we really um, centered and in, in the rubric we utilize, we gave a additional points for people that were coming from our weakest housing markets. And those weak housing markets coincide with other um, challenge, challenges like higher rates of crime, high rates of vacancy, and, and so forth and so on. So these are the community leaders that oftentimes their groups can't hire a zoning attorney. They can't hire kind of other professionals to navigate the system for them. So they really need to uh, kind of bone up so that they're better prepared to um, advocate on their own. And we also want to make sure people know about resources that were free or close to free that exist. To even know about a neighborhood design center, for example, there are people who um, needed to know about um, the next presenters organization. So um, it was a really great opportunity. And, and one of the things we were also thoughtful about in terms of mix is sometimes we're only looking at geography, sometimes we're looking at race, right? Sometimes we're looking at socioeconomic. But for us in Baltimore, we were also looking at tenure in the city. And the reason why that's important is that there are a lot of legacy residents that feel like people are more responsive to a newer resident and their wishes than someone that maybe has always been from there. So someone who was a younger applicant but was born in Baltimore would actually have a longer tenure than someone that was older but maybe has only been here four or five years and they're in the 30s. So we tried to think beyond just kind of the demographics people tend to think about to make sure we had a representative mix. And um, where we saw that we had some geog 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 geographic challenges, we worked with our community planners that cover those areas to to just kind of double down on the marketing and the outreach so that people knew about it. So I wanted to share um, some of the alumni success from th these efforts. So in our very first class, we had um, a tremendous talent, um, a poet, her name is Lady Brion. She had this on her heart to establish um, the first state um, approved black arts district in, um, the, you know, in the state. And she wanted it to be based in Pennsylvania Avenue, which was a very famous thoroughfare in, in black West Baltimore, where so many uh, great artists were not only um, coming to, to this street, some of them grew up just around the corner. So it was a place that um, not only grew these artists, but also welcomed them. So she really wanted to lean into this, this history as a way to galvanize the community and foster community development. So she um, was in our first class and that gave her some of the tools to finalize the application, which was successful. And we've continued to be a partner and thought partner with her as she continues through the next phases of her project. So we're very proud of her. We also have Eric Stevenson, who is an alum of our Planning Academy, and he's the first alum to actually become a member of the Planning Commission, which is a huge deal um, in this Baltimore, they have a lot of power under um, the city charter around land use and our capital budget. We also have um, Miss Regina Hammond, who is the community leader in East Baltimore community known as Johnson Square. Um, this is a community that's just outside of Mount Vernon, just outside of the um, um, Johns Hopkins redevelopment quarter. They were like kind of missing <laughs> some mm -hmm. of the things that could have um, maybe, you know, kind of swept them up in other um, redevelopment opportunities. So um, they needed some, some tools around how they could really stand on their own and look at the different anchors they're cultivating even to create a neighborhood plan. And she was already a dynamo before she got to the Planning Academy, but she even said it, she felt it took her leadership to another level, a heightened level of, of understanding.
And then, um, you know, another example is that we had a, um, a community partner, um, Pam Curtis in Northwest Baltimore, who had been um, had had a vision for a community art installation for years, but she credits on um, the Planning Academy with creating the relationships she needed and kind of the process awareness she needed to really make that installation go from, um, you know, vision to reality. So um, there's tangible positive outcomes to people feeling like they've been um, more adequately prepared to engage in the system. So here's a quote from um, a representative, a participant rather in our planning academy from Westport, um, James. I think another thing we forget about when we're dealing um, with community partners um, is that oftentimes they are so wedded to what's happening in their community, it can be really, really hard to connect with other people that might be able to help them. So the Planning Academy actually fostered networking for the community members. So people were like, I would have never known you, James, because you're in South Baltimore and I'm in East Baltimore, but now I know you, I realize we have a lot in common and they're helping each other navigate things. And that's actually the best outcome is strengthening the bench of community support for community leaders so that they're not out here just feeling because the more they're overwhelmed, the less productive your planning process is also probably going to be with them. So I know I need to wrap up. So I wanted to just quickly um, describe, well, there's some pictures of the Planning Academy. We get them outside of the room. We want to make sure, make sure they see. And what's interesting is that um, even in Baltimore, where we have, um, you know, one out, of th one out of every three households does not have regular access to a car. But still, a lot of times people drive past things, but they don't see them. And getting um, the participants to actually walk around Lexington Market, walk around different places. They, they saw things they've always seen, but they see them for the first time. So that's something that was really important for us to, to kind of share how we see communities, because sometimes they weren't even seeing their own communities quite the same way if they're not regularly engaged on foot or by bike. So that was exciting. So the last thing, the last two things I want to share is this um, spectrum of public participation. I think that oftentimes we in government and agencies and institutions say, I'm going to let you know what's going on. And that might be the high watermark of our engagement. <laughs> and I really want to challenge all of us to um, move a bit beyond that um, to something a bit more meaningful, because oftentimes that's where the disconnect and the tension comes from, because the community member came in to collaborate, which is to partner with the partner with us um, that to include some decision making, you know, and developing some concepts. But we may have come to that meeting only wanting to inform. So that misalignment of expectations can also um, really set you back. So I think that planners need to maybe have more honest conversations, both, like, both internal to their organization, but with some community um, stakeholders very early on about where in this continuum do you feel um, you need to be to have the, the most fruitful you know, relationship? And then be honest about kind of what skills or bandwidth you have so that people aren't feeling disappointed or feeling that maybe you just don't care. That can be conveyed simply because um, we haven't managed expectations um, well. And I believe Preservation Maryland, will you share this presentation afterwards so if people wanna look at this, they can look at it later? Yes, okay. absolutely. So the last thing I want to leave you with is our sustainability plan, because again, a lot of our work around equity was rooted in our sustainability um, division's efforts to update their um, sustainability plan from 2009. So in 2019, this is the first citywide plan we adopted that utilized um, an equity lens. And, and there are a couple of features of this planning process that I think are particularly important to lift up. We often utilize consultants to better understand populations. So think about it. You've hired someone from a completely different jurisdiction to help you connect with the people that are around the corner. Maybe it's not the best use of your, 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 your money and your investment, but this is something that happens all the time. And then that out of town you know, consultant, all they're gonna do is reach out to the community members that are overworked, you know, over contacted, you know, just kind of overburdened generally, and try to extract from them you know, all of their expertise, lived experience and whatnot. But that's all like free, mental labor and emotional labor, but the out-of-town consultant gets all the money. So we were really thinking that even from the beginning of this planning process, how can we have more like equitable, even compensation of the expertise community members bring? So we started with um, 125 Baltimore residents that um, were um, deemed sustainability ambassadors. And those ambassadors um, were kind of divided into teams. So there was like a lead ambassador and, and a team. So those lead, lead ambassadors were compensated, but they were also given a budget to a modest one, you know, a few hundred bucks. But when you're able to break bread with folks, you know, brainstorm, you know, maybe even have um, 
some trinkets to entice people to fill out the survey. I mean, it's amazing what people do for like a keychain. You know, it doesn't even have to be like <laughs> something major, you know. But um, I think just honoring the time someone is taking out of their life to make our plans better, um, particularly in, a commu in communities where people have a lot of needs, I think it's, it shows respect from an institution and from a government agency because we do give companies money to do this type of work. And sometimes they're not even able to do it that well because they're disconnected from the people we're trying to learn more about. So I just want to throw that out there as something that you consider. And um, we also, when we were embarking on kind of the surveys, we realized that at first, the first kind of wave of them, we were not getting kind of the demographic parity um, that we really wanted for this to be um, reflective of the will and desires of the city. So instead of going, that's all we got, that's what happened. Because that's what happens sometimes, you go, well, that's what it is. <laughs> We decided we need to go back, be more intentional, and see how we can improve the responses by, um, you know, partnering with different, you know, stakeholders, different institutions, and we were able to increase, you know, some of the response rates. And and I, I think a lot of people probably wouldn't have done that because we just go with well, that. That is what it is. But no, just keep trying to be better is really one of my big messages. So the last thing um, is, you know, just reiterating, have multiple ways for people to um, to share. We had um, we we deemed it official comment for people to participate on Facebook, Twitter, IG, and LinkedIn all at the same time during a certain amount of time, so we could log those responses, the intensity, how many people not only made those comments, but how many people liked them. Think outside the box about how you gauge where people are. It doesn't always have to be a formal typed comment that's submitted because that might privilege someone that's more of a official stakeholder or professional stakeholder and not a community member. And also, um, because I used to work on federal regulations, if you go to regulations.gov, you can see everyone's comment on any regulation that's proposed by the federal government. But oftentimes at the local level, things go to emails. So that means people's feedback goes into, goes into an ether. They don't really know where it goes and no one else gets to see it. So we used a platform called Civic Comment. It's now called, called Convey. Put it this way, they probably should have um, focus group the new name because I think Civic Comment was great, but it's um, Conveyo. You see it right there in the presentation. But um, what was great about this is that not only could you comment in the draft plan, other people could see your comment and respond to your comment. And what's really mm -hmm. great about that is if you go in and you're Jessica, you're like, hmm, they got it covered. You can go about your business because you feel that people have addressed your issue. But if you see that no one's talking about something that you think is super duper important, you can prioritize lifting your voice and making some time, you know, to put that in there. So we've we've um, lent our license to other agencies that are undergoing public comment because we feel like it, it aids more transparency. So, um, you know, this was our first um, present at uh, first citywide plan used uh, an equity lens and we we're very intentional about the outreach and we're also intentional about developing our community members so that moving forward all our planning efforts will continue to improve in quality so thank you so much thank you so much stephanie and um i forgot to mention this at the offset but we do have a question box at any point if you would like to um enter questions in the question box after ali's presentation um we're going to go ahead and um, and get some of those out there. Um, so real quickly, while I'm switching over to Ali, um, this is maybe a, a basic question, but we thought we would want to know um, who here seeks out planning meetings. Um, so if you can let us know uh, while I switch around the presentations real quick, um, if you seek out planning meetings. Okay, give you one more second to answer in yes or no. Looks like almost everyone has voted and then I've got um, Ali all ready to come in. Okay, last call, I'm gonna do the countdown. Five, four, three, two, one. Okay, um, so let me go. So it looks like we have a fairly even split actually <laughs> between those who seek out planning meetings and um, those who do not. Um, so we are um, hoping, you know, as we continue to think about why that is and what could maybe um, as we get into the Q and A part, um, a little bit about, um, what might help you incentivize you to to go seek out planning meetings? So um, I am now uh, 
going to hand this over uh, to Allie. And Allie, you have control. All right. Um, well, thank you, everyone. And, and thank you, Preservation Maryland, for this opportunity to uh, share some of the work that the Neighborhood Design Center does and our process. And also, um, it's such a wonderful opportunity to uh, speak after Stephanie Smith, who's doing such amazing work with the Baltimore City Planning Department. Um, and our organization is super excited about it because the more people who understand these processes and feel comfortable participating, the better our built environments are. And that's what we're all after. So um, I'm just gonna outline a little bit about the Neighborhood Design Center. And then I'm gonna talk specifically about our process and a little bit less about the end product of our work. Um, again, because I think um, as Stephanie was lifting up procedural equity, um, for us, our process, and our participatory process really is um, at the heart of what we think makes our work different, but also why it is so powerful um, for our communities and our communities who have experienced um, systemic and long-term disinvestment. Um, so the Neighborhood Design Center has been in Baltimore City. We've had the honor of being there for 51 years. Um, we came out of actually the, the civil rights movement and uh, Whitney M. Young's speech to the American Institute of Architects um, really inspired the founders of the Neighborhood Design Center to start to understand the architect's role um, in the state of affairs of cities in 1968, which is extraordinarily analogous to, the, to today, unfortunately. Um, and at the Neighborhood Design Center today, we really understand Whitney M. Young's call to be to all professions in and adjacent to the built environment. Um, and so for us, we are landscape architects, we are planners, we are architects, um, we are historic preservationists. Um, we work in a, in a multitude of disciplines, but all through the umbrella of community design. Um, and what makes community design different um, is, a, is a deep belief in the need to engage people in every part of, of the design and planning process. Um, and at NDC, our work is really deeply rooted in our values. Um, and for us, our values focus first and foremost on the fact that people are experts on their places. They may not have every technical answer, but they gen genuinely know what they want and need, and they know what's happened. Um, and additionally, we believe that it there is no one who is undeserving of beautiful, healthy, functional spaces and places. And this really drives everything that we do, this philosophy. Um, so the Neighborhood Design Center has taken on uh, more than 3,700 projects over our 51 years. Uh, we now have two offices. We opened in Prince George's County uh, 26 years ago. And our work can take the form of small landscape architecture designs and um, streetscapes all the way through to architectural space plans for nonprofits, up to large park master plans and even neighborhood plans. Um, and our work is always community initiated. Um, and we do take it through conceptual design. Um, we are not ourselves a standalone architecture or planning or landscape architecture firm. Um, and I'm happy to talk about that at, at, in the questions, if there's questions about that. Um, but the focus of our work really is our process. And this slide outlines our process that we are all projects start locally. They start with a community member's brilliant idea and they start before us. Um, we really get involved as that spark starts moving forward. Um, and we always appreciate connections to helping other people with sparks. Um, and then that begins what we call a co-design process. And that co-design process is really broad and it starts very, very early in our process. We then will support, some of our work will support fundraising and we always help a group plan for implementation and sustainability, but we are not those partners. We bring on other people who can do that work or we work with our groups to make sure that they can take that on themselves. Um, but 
the reason that we think that all of these people that are important to come to the table together is that um, you know, oftentimes design and planning processes are really opaque. There's no reason that as a homeowner, you understand these problems. Um, there's, it's not natural nor intuitive. And so for us, when we team our volunteers up with our community partners and we bring in our local government agencies, when we come together, someone on that team has experience with the process and everyone else learns from it. And so that model that really does help make a planning process more navigable for a community, um, for the organizations and the residents, also flips around. And I wanna emphasize how powerful it is for our agency partners and for other nonprofits and our design professionals to hear from our residents and our community organizations because they're getting a really great perspective that you can't, you can't live everywhere and you can't be of every community. And so, by bringing everyone together as experts, and there's no shortage of expertise, that's the best news ever, is that you can have more experts around the table and you are no less an expert. There's just more people who know. Um, and that's really the space we love to be in and that's the space we welcome people into as we do this work. Um, and our goal is to share this information broadly because NDC doesn't believe that we are the only game in town. And we really do want people to be able to do this work without us. It's an honor and a privilege to work with every community we work with. And we are so proud when our community members send us an email that they're like, look what we did. You know, here's our success story. Um, hey, Allie, we did this without you. And it's like, that's awesome. That's the end game. Um, so just all that to say that this team building is a space we spend a lot of time in. And I'm gonna go through a little bit more about that process. So this starts actually from the very, very beginning of a project. Um, we work with our partner on scoping, which is a little bit different than a traditional design brief, which tends to be a sort of unilateral. Um, we work together. We work together for a lot of reasons. Um, many times we have community partners who would never have been able to put together a design brief and have no reason to think about all of the issues that often um, really are important and inform the projects and are needed to be thought about from the beginning. Um, and so what we do is we talk through together, you know, what what is the problem this design seeks to solve? Oftentimes we're given solutions um, and it's really important we feel to understand what's underlying that and undergirding it. Oftentimes the solution proposed actually is the right one, but we need to really understand the why to be able to see the what. Um, in addition to that, um, we talk a ton about what this design is going to be used for. And there's no one right way to do it. Some communities really want to use this as an, as an advocacy tool to say, here's what's possible. Why aren't we getting what's possible? Um, other places, they want to change hearts and minds because they may understand they don't have large scale support for something, but they really, really want to try for it. Um, and other times it's actually a tool for fundraising because if you show the capacity to have rendering, to have you know community feedback and a design based in that, even if it's conceptual, it's not fully baked, um, that really will move your application to the top of the pile and allow you to move that project forward. So there's no one way to do it and there's no right path with us, but we wanna understand it early and often because it really will inform how we re outreach, who who we engage and partner with and who we're kind of bringing around that big experts table and when. And it also helps us work with our partners as we talk through that implementation, funding, maintenance, that sustainability spectrum. Um, we also spend a lot of time, you know, talking about the people and additional partners we need around the table. Um, and our staff does to the best of our ability lay out um, what we believe the process is to attain the group's goals for the project. Um, again, depending on what that goal is. Um, from regulatory assessments uh, and government agency meetings we need to set up to make sure that the right people are aware or we're starting the right process, all the way through to research on grants and connections to people who you know, know different groups and might be able to start partnering if this is a larger endeavor. 
Um, this isn't to say that our process is foolproof, but what we really believe is that by being so intentional and methodical upfront and sharing all of this with our partner in a way that isn't meant to overwhelm, so we're not using jargon, we're not throwing it all at somebody at once, but we're really having this in a conversation together. Um, we try to be, we hope that we're clear about where people have power and when they can leverage it. Uh, it's never a guarantee that you'll, uh, you know, have have success at every point, but it is a Apologies, a my cat uh, messed up your presentation. <laughs> One moment, I, let me I get appreciate back that in. the cat wanted to take us back to the meeting. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> okay, it's back. <laughs> um, and I should just say, as I'm speaking, I'm just going to put up slides that have guiding questions that um, really move NDC through our process um, without touching on them too much as we go through. Um, so the other thing that NDC spends a fair amount of time on um, is to make sure that we're asking these really important guiding questions. And this goes back to exactly what Stephanie was talking about in terms of understanding context. Um, understanding context helps us make sure that we are being as successful as we can. It also is a harm mitigation strategy. Um, we believe genuinely like you have to do your homework. Um, because we can, it is so easy to participate in systems that have, have done harm and will continue to do harm if they're not disrupted. So we have to be able to look at them and see them. And so we believe deeply in this step. Um, we invite our partners into this step to really help us understand, you know, what's your story? And then we'll go back and we'll kind of check out how other people are telling this story. And then we start to really understand like, well, what's at the heart of that? Why is this dissonant? Um, but this gives us a holistic starting point really to work with a community and to build a productive and trusting relationship. Um, it, again, nothing is a guarantee that it's all going to work, but we feel as though these steps are really important to get us there. I keep going too many. Sorry. Is there a way to go backwards? Uh, oh. There I just went all through. Mm -hmm. Ah, thank you. Um, so when we plan community engagement, uh, which we do very intentionally and very, we take very, very, very seriously, um, we we do use the justice and equity lens as we're we're thinking through this. Um, because we're, we really just want to be sure, again, that we are centering those most affected and those most usually left out of planning and design processes. Um, in addition to considering who we reach out to, uh, we also work really hard to think about design activities that are welcoming and accessible to everyone. So it's not just sending everybody the invite. It's as Stephanie was saying, it's where the meeting is, it's when the meeting is, and then it's also how the meeting is structured. Um, and I mean, I know we all love a good design charrette. We love them, we do, and that's okay. And there are places where that is a fantastic solution. And there are places that that's actually a really othering um, and inaccessible solution. And so, We've been in the space of a lot of small focus groups recently, specifically in a lot of our um, in our communities with newcomers, and have found that that's really, really been a positive step. So it's it's really antithetical to getting everybody together. It's it's a very tender, tended small group conversation. Um, but again, knowing that all of these things are to are okay when we think about them and we understand them and we apply them. In, with intention. Um, we also really want to think about um, providing food and childcare whenever possible. Um, you know, I know it's not possible for every group to provide that um, for all kinds of regulatory reasons, but when we can, we love to feed people. And um, if it's possible to also make sure that folks who are, you know, navigating jobs, Navigating child care, care really do have an opportunity to participate as well. Um, I will say we also reach out to our teams a ton um, in public space, 
you know, we think about who really isn't welcome in public space. And it's the most, it is truly some of the most gratifying outreach we do. Our teens are so smart. They're so on top of it. And they are so eager to answer upon being asked. Um, and so I encourage all of you to really think about how you're, you can bring young people into conversations and really honor them because they know so much and they really are our future. And we are laying the groundwork for civic participation for the rest of their lives. You know, if they were asked at 16 about what they wanted the park to be, and then when they came back to co from college, because let's be real about timelines, um, the park was complete. I mean, what does that tell you? That so legitimizes your role in a process. And there's nothing better than a success that makes you want to get more involved. Um, and I think for all of us as designers and planners and the ones who are facilitating these meetings, the more people who have a series of successes to pull back on, that is a lot easier facilitation than people who have a lot of very legitimate, I'm not saying they're not legitimate, of very legitimate grudges and gripes. And so part of it, I think, you know, it's like, it's our duty. And then it also is good for us too, to really do this work well. Um, things have been really tricky with COVID. Um, I'm just gonna say this kind of briefly, but when you spend your whole career trying to convince people that they have to get together, they have to talk to one another and they have to listen to one another, to suddenly be presented with a situation where you cannot do that is difficult. Um, we have seen, and I think everybody's seen it, that the issues that have always been there that really, you know, um, have been present, but maybe we were able to not look right at, have been laid bare. Um, the digital divide is real. Um, community, you know, Community members who are just, you know, stressed about other things are actively grieving. Um, it's really real. And that's not a, sh a shared, equally shared burden. And so we've been in a space for a while where the, the question we hold deepest is how are we making sure we're not doing harm? And how are we not just pushing our agendas? Um, so I will say, you know, it's we're navigating this slowly and case by case, but We've also had some really great successes. And I will say that, um, you know, we've had an opportunity to work with some University of Maryland students and they were finding some virtual reality apps uh, that are phone-based that really allow for cool opportunities to check out visualizations of changes in places. Um, and the power of offering visualization changes in places where change might seem really overwhelming to think about. Um, has been so cool and young people get really really excited about it too um and the other thing we've realized is that we can do meetings virtually and we can live stream a meeting we can record a meeting we can share a meeting and so that when we have community members who have accommodations um might have mobility um concerns we have an opportunity to share with them and that's been a great lesson uh, you know we'll survive in this space um so I think I just kind of want to lift up that there are some good things that have come out, even if COVID's been tricky. Um, I think I have a project I can share, but I think I'm going to kind of wrap there. And if it comes up in conversation, let's talk about it. But. Okay, thank you so much, Ali. Um, so what we're going to do now is we're going to open up uh, questions and um, also, while we're kind of people are thinking about their questions, also um, we have um, another poll, which is uh, kind of to the question since it was a 50 50 split on who is uh, seeking out these planning meetings. So we kind of wanted to see um, what barriers are preventing you um, from uh, participating more in the planning process. And um, just wanted to say uh, in the question box right now, we have more of a comment. But it's a great comment, so I'm going to share it. It's um, yay teens, not a question, just here for to cheer for teens. So um, that is <laughs> that is great because um, it is something you know. I think it's something all of us in our professions are talking about a lot about how to engage um, different generations. Um, so we are getting in a bunch of responses. Um, you know, feel free to pick more than one box there, um, and if that makes you spark any 
conversations, um, you know, thinking about how your meetings are held um, or any questions that you might have um, about any particular models or follow up on anything you hear of. Um, and you can also go to um, go to to Ali and uh, talk about her example if you'd be interested in hearing a little bit more about that example. Um, you know, you can put that in the, the comment box as well. So let me just take a look. Looks like almost everyone has voted. Um, any final responses? I'm going to do my countdown. Uh, five, four, three, two, one. So we're going to close that out and then we'll share that up there. Um, so uh, this is actually, um, I'll be curious, Stephanie and Allie, for your feedback on this. Um, it looks like the number one um, response is lack of awareness that the meetings are, um, are being held. And so I'd be kind of curious to get um, some feedback on that. That's followed by the time of day of the meeting. And obviously there's a lot more things we could go into, but we're limited to five options. So um, right. mm -hmm. um, if there's other things that you think this is what really, uh, please feel free to put them in the, the question um, box as a comment. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and um, and hide this so that we can see Ali and Stephanie. And I don't know if you have any feedback to that while we, um, yeah. while we, while we wait for uh, some questions to come in. Absolutely. Actually, I'm not surprised by that response at all. Um, I would dare say that most institutions in the government are not acclaimed for their marketing efforts in general. <laughs> um, <laughs> so um, we're talking about meetings specifically, but I'm talking about in general. I mean, there's so many programs and things that really could um, 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 positively impact someone's life that oftentimes when you go to a community meeting and tell them about it, they're like, what, that's been around for 10 years? I didn't know that program existed. So I definitely think this is where um, I'll, you know, because I'm wearing my, you know, the government hat, I'll, I'll just, you know, put on the government mantle. Um, when I um, came on board three years ago um, to the agency, I, I really wanted to, um, one, beef up our, our list because many agencies have like, you know, newsletters, they can be weekly, monthly, things like that. We mm -hmm. monthly one. We actually have an open rate that's like north of 25%. And anyone who monitors email open rates should know that is astronomical. And I think it's because we don't email you that much. You get what I'm saying? You're like one, <laughs> a lot of really good quality information. You know what I mean? In this, um, you know, in this list. And we were really intentional about growing the list. Um, so that was one of the ways that I think um, I, I really wanted to jump in. Also, our newsletter was initially a PDF. So that was like like week two. This must be mobile friendly because if I had to look at a PDF on my phone, <laughs> not anything about anything, I'm like, oh, I just can't do it, right? So um, that that immediately needed to happen. It needed to be mobile friendly, um, whatever you know, kind of way that you're broadcasting it, because that's the way many people are, are going to learn about it um, online is on their phone. Another thing that was really important was um. Um, really getting more follows on our Facebook page. Now, Baltimore is a city that only has, at this point, you know, just approximately 600,000 people. But I'm proud to say that our planning Facebook following eclipsed DC, far bigger than Seattle, far bigger than Chicago. These are cities that are, in some instances, way bigger than us. But I was like, now Philadelphia has way more than us. So that's my next, you know, I need to, you know, get past Philadelphia. But, um, uh, Facebook is where like the everyday person is. When you look at kind of the, de the demographic reality and the educational attainment reality of the different platforms, um, you know, some skew very, very young. I mean, because really young people are trying to flee older people. Every time like their grandma shows up at a platform, they're like, I'm out of here, right? So Facebook is where they think, you know, their mom is, their big sister, their auntie, their grandma. But there's really a lot of people that we want coming out to these meetings too. It's a good cross section. Twitter um, um, skews a bit more affluent, a big, a usually um, high education attainment. So there's these different ways that we prioritize. We're gonna double down on Facebook and Instagram. Good thing about planning, there's a picture for everything you want to talk about. So Instagram friendly, um, you know, you know, kind of sector. Um, we decided not to do a Twitter account because you have to tweet constantly to really make it worth your while. And if you don't have the capacity to tweet all the time. Just don't do it. No one's want to. Nobody wants to see you every ten years. Nobody wants to deal with that, right? So for us, um, creating a Facebook event for our meetings is part of like what we do, and that was pre-COVID. 
Now it's even easier during COVID because quite frankly, now we can not only host a virtual panel via WebEx or meeting, we can live stream it to Facebook for people who don't generally engage with us and meet a whole new population of people. So um, for us, um, Facebook is free. We also encourage our community associations because they have the same problem. People in their community mm -hmm. associations I mean, people in their neighborhood are like, I didn't even know you had a community association. I did not know you had meetings. So, I mean, there's a lot of people um, involved in these planning processes that really should be centering communications, but it's often a third and fourth tier concern, much to, I think, um, the peril of, like, the quality of all the engagement, because um, I, I am not surprised not knowing is, like, at the top of the list. And also, I think we need to lean into um, kind of, um, you know, our elected and other people that have meaningful platforms they're often happy to throw in your meeting into a newsletter or something else that they have or on their Facebook, you know, or something like that too. Mm -hmm. And I think they forget just to even share it. I mean, they don't, they might not do it, but if they do, that's great too. And I'll, I'll just say we had a comment come in while you were talking, Stephanie, about um, announcing comment, uh, community meetings uh, two weeks or less in advance gives less chance for people to, um, to not attend is what the comment is. Um, longer notice is needed for for better response. So I think that speaks to to what you were saying. And also maybe for things that require public comment, um, we're trying to standardize the time frame because, for example, with federal government, it either has to be 60, 90, whatever the days are, is pursuant to to like the Administrative Procedures Act, right? But at the local level, people might go, hmm, I want to give you two weeks to respond to that. Hmm, I want to give you 60 days. Like we're realizing we want 30 days to be our minimum because like you said by the time someone finally hears about it and it was over two weeks ago you missed out maybe on some perspective that could have helped out so i also think the time frame that people have to respond to things people should think about that too yeah and i do to that point i'd love to lift up the city of hyattsville uh they have a platform called speak up hyattsville which has been really really interesting because it's how they announce meetings it's a public forum where you can actually yourself as a citizen um bring topics up but what they also are able to do is share out meetings that have happened and been recorded and then allow you time to give feedback on that platform um and i think there's something really really key to being able to announce early but know that if you missed it you have again that 30 days where you have access to the information and you can yourself comment see other people's comments and send the link to your friends. Um, not everybody processes in real time and there's nothing wrong with that. And so sometimes it is like you go for a run the next day and all of a sudden you're like, uh-huh, this is the comment that I knew was somewhere in my brain but couldn't get it out. Or you drive by the site and you realize like, wait, no, that couldn't happen. As not nice as it sounds to have, I don't know, a cafe, no, no way possible. Um, and I think that, and you know, for everyone to think about that, that little bit of lag and realizing that everything can't be in real time. And I think COVID has given us the opportunity to understand the asynchronous um, participation um, and still give space to, to respond to one another. I think it's really interesting to start to see. Um, and I know that we are uh, just a little bit past two. Um, Stephanie and Elle, we have a couple more questions if you guys are able to hang on for a moment. Um, so um, this actually is a good springboard for the next question, which is to both of you, which is uh, when conditions aren't ideal, how do you get the planning process back on track? Which I think speaks to what you were just saying with COVID and response time. And um, so, yeah. Um, so um, I remember Ali mentioned about, you know, people just having a lot on their plate right now. So being kind of respectful that you know, they might have so many things pulling them in a lot of different directions. So one of the things we um, did, you know, because we're always in a state of some type of planning process at the community level, or there's like a project going on. So we um, had our community planners just kind of go through um, the target community leaders that they engage with most regularly and just check in. Yeah. So like a call that doesn't have an express agenda goes mm -hmm. so far because particularly early in this, um, crisis which is kind of know what was going on and these community leaders that were really maybe um jazzed about conversations around you know preservation or development right now they're just trying to find food for their neighbors or you know they're doing some other stuff right now so i think that that went far to kind of 
make us not seem tone deaf and completely out of it, just to jump into shop talk <laughs> and, and to really kind of honor the moment we're in. So I, I would um, encourage people to the extent your bandwidth allows, try to incorporate a couple of calls a month to key stakeholders that are not full of like deliverable driven content and are just kind of more, you're a human. I know there's a lot on your plate. Um, maybe ask them to tell you what are some better ways for us to support moving this project forward and, and communicating with you. Um, you know, don't assume, just, just ask them, you know, cause um, some folks, um, you know, surprisingly, we, we went on some of those calls thinking they would be complaining or concerned about X and it was like a completely different thing that, um, you know, concerned about. So um, I just say right now, um, people want to feel connected. I remember um, talking to um, the superintendent um, of Baltimore City Schools, um, Dr. Sanelisis, about anyone who has a kid in Baltimore City Public Schools gets a million robocalls about, you know, whatever's happening. And um, he was saying um, to the teens, that they actually liked it. And this was actually shocking because it was a bit of connection. Like everything's been disconnected. So even that robo call, that's not even like a live person, it felt touch, you know what I mean? So um, I know for us, we've been thinking about um, tele town halls, even though that's like super old school, um, the mayor did quite a few of them that I participated in. And I was impressed at the thousands upon thousands of people that participated because at the end of the day, um, the phone is the most unifying piece of technology really there is out there because no matter your education level, the language you speak or whatever, most people know how to navigate a phone pretty well. And um, it, it, of course it doesn't lend itself to you know visual um, presentations, but if you're doing an update you know, kind of conversation with the community group. Don't always think it has to be um, what we're doing right here. Um, a conference line can sometimes be the better option if you know the population you're dealing with. And then also um, socially distant outdoor conversation. And that's best with like small groups, you know, you're talking about 10 or six people and, you know, you can, um, you know, with proper PPE and, and um, distancing sometimes facilitate, you know, a, a decent conversation. Um, so I, I'll actually be going to a community group tonight. Uh, outside. Otherwise, they would not see me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think that I think I would echo everything Stephanie said. And I think what's at the heart of that is this isn't about what's at the heart of our process are people. And these are relationships. It's not a timeline, it's a relationship. And so sometimes we have to move at the speed of trust. And that's hard because that's really hard to schedule. And that's really hard to promise if you've got a funder and you've got deliverables. It's tough. I mean, I'm not saying this is easy, but I am saying that that's at the core of what we have to do. And if you have trepidation, my money is on the fact that your partner does too. The community probably does too. And so how do we position ourselves not to always have to have the answers? but to be the ones who are clued in to be able to ask, ask the question. That's our role. And so I think exactly what Stephanie said, if you're not sure like what's going on, call somebody who you think might know. Like, hey, I felt like the, you know, we have really good momentum and now I can't get an answer to an email. Do you have a sense of what's going on? Am I missing something? Um, the worst that somebody can do is say, I don't know either. But then you try to solve it together. So now you got somebody else who's working on it too. Um, because again, it's none of these processes are exactly the same, they're not replicable. Um, and each community isn't the same, and each community, if you go back to the same community over the course of time, it's not the same. So it's just how are we always showing up and acknowledging relationally how we have to check in and communicate early, communicate often, and know that we're people and we're talking to other people and we're honoring one another in the process. Um, so I think what we're going to wrap up with is kind of a follow up um, about uh, what Stephanie, you were just saying about um, phone and different tools. Um, and I know, Ali, you mentioned some tools that are being used. Mm -hmm. So um, yeah, as we all kind of adjust to this new COVID lifestyle, what are some of the um, costs of the best tools that you're seeing being used and how are those, how is that something that people can kind of scale to their, their circumstances? 
Um, thank you. So, like, as you can imagine, um, community members, even some small firms, you know, sometimes these things can be really challenging when you're thinking about costs. So, for example, we're all sitting on GoToWebinar. I'm sure we've all navigated probably a handful of different platforms during this uh, time um, from Zoom, WebEx, what have you. But, you know, there was this little product called Google that um, was probably <laughs> I've had a camera, you know, um, I've had like this group virtual um, opportunity that's been free for you this whole time and you know people might not have been aware of that so we've even told people you know particularly if that community partner emails you with a google email you know that gives you a good opening you know if it's aol mm -hmm. you know maybe not you know what i mean but if it's a google email i think that's a door opener to say there's some free tools that you know don't require you to get this zoom account or webex account within google video that could facilitate some of the same mm -hmm. Here. So I try to tell people about the things that are like free or close to free because I mean a lot of these groups are, are strapped, you know, and even mm -hmm. some of these have limited budgets for what they can do. Um, another um, um, thing, um, you know, I, in addition to kind of like the um, the phone thing, is that um, I really think that um, we have to think more about. I know this is like painful to say because we're in a, a time where we want to be more thoughtful about um, generating more paper. But if we are going to have to reach some people that do not have access to the web, we have to think about what type of packets do we mail to some of those key stakeholders so that if we do have to have a phone call, they're prepared to be visually informed just the way other people are. Because one of the things about all the um, the um, virtual streaming uh, platforms is that they generally have a phone number available. So people can't call in, but they will miss the visual. So if you're intentional about scheduling and are able to kind of provide those materials in advance to people that you know will have difficulty or challenge um, logging on, um, that can be a way to kind of cover, you know, kind of a lot of different people's comfort zones, the phone person and the person that has no problem logging on. Um, also, I, I just think that, um, again, social media is just this huge resource. It, it, I was looking on it pre-COVID, and I'm going to continue to mine it. Um, I think that um, communications is something that people don't pay enough attention to. It seems, I think, a little light to people. But if they realize, like I always tell someone, if anyone refers to your product, your business, your agency as the best kept secret, that's actually terrible that is actually a, um, a recognition of failure because if it's so awesome people should know about it so um you know that's something that i, I want to just impress upon people there can be um even some assistance you can get with this from um nonprofit and universities because we have you know at least in baltimore we have mica you know art college there's a lot of schools that have majors around videography you know a lot, a lot of different things and i think that we forget some of those people have to have um capstone projects they have to have you know different things so um, you know thinking outside the box about how you can partner with people that need experience but you need some resources and some you know things produced that look inspiring and a little more polished but you don't have the resources I think our colleges and universities, even though it's a virtual situation we're going into, a lot of this stuff can be achieved remotely. They can even take stuff off your cell phone footage and maybe edit it you know, into something really great. Think about some of those partners too. Yeah, I would I would echo all that. I mean, I think it's get creative. I mean, I'm like the I love post-it notes. I have piles of them like within arm's reach. I'll just throw this out there. Google Slides is so underrated for kind of a digital post-it note sort. This sounds super nerdy, but as long as you can get people to Google, to Google Slides, and that's a huge, you have to really read the room to make sure you can do that, and you might have to do a tutorial. Don't be afraid to set up a 15-minute tutorial a day in advance, two hours early, whatever it is. That's actually a way to make it more accessible. It's the same as providing slides in advance. That's not just for people who don't have video access. It's for people who have all different kinds of accommodations, and it's an equity issue. When we're online, having this stuff available beforehand, if you're asking for participation, that's necessary. Um, but I would say start thinking outside the box a little bit. And the thing that I would say that I've learned in this is that the shinier the tool, the more difficult it is to really navigate. And I have found that we have been down and dirty these days. Like 
I have been taking, I have been in Google Hangouts as a small focus group with a Google Doc open on a slide share typing, going, did I hear you correctly? Did I hear you correctly? And it is so not cool or branded or stamped or community design, but it has been so darned effective. Um, and I think that that's what we have to start doing. I mean, if you really want to get into an app, I mean, I've used Mural. Um, there's another one that's really similar that has a nearly the same name uh, that I can't recall right now, but it's a whiteboard app. Um, you know, it's pretty accessible. It's amazing. It's expensive. Um, so balance that, you know, and I, I think that there's a way, you know, NGC often talked about how sometimes we would present in, in person, we would have really beautiful printed out sheets. And other times we'd have handwritten sheets. And that wasn't random, that was really, really intentional. Because what we need to do is strike a balance between the, the level of formality that people need to feel honored and respected and legitimized in a process with something casual enough that it doesn't feel like, oh, I'm gonna make a mistake and oh, this is so intimidating. So those tools have to be seen through that same lens because these tools are in service of an end game. So it's not about the tool, it's about what you're trying to achieve and who's your audience. And I think that's the hardest thing about this time because we all wanted tools, we all wanted solutions, we all wanted best practices. But what we all needed to do was spend time figuring out for our audiences, for our goals, for what we wanted to do in this, with our ethics and our values and everything else, how to accomplish it. And truly those phone calls go so far. We've been doing the same thing, the email or the phone call to the partner that's just like, how are you doing? Um, you know, and getting the word out too, building those relationships gets the word out. You know, I have a partner who I text when we need to get the word out and I'm like, time to put it on WhatsApp, you ready? Because WhatsApp is a kind of, it's it's still a world that we're trying to understand. I know a lot of government partners, it's like, oh wait, I can't regulate what's on the WhatsApp channel and so it's tough. But you have someone in your community who's on WhatsApp. I know it. And so make everything a JPEG and then you text it around, right? Like I think it's starting to understand that the knowledge is there because people communicate with one another in places. It's that we're disconnected from it. And so how do we get ourselves connected to it? And again, it's kind of that, who are the people in the neighborhood who are not just like the old guard leaders, Stephanie, like you were saying, because they're legitimate and important, and I'm not saying they aren't. And there are young people, there are new people, there are all different kinds of folks who lead in totally different ways, who we need to clue into. And we might meet them in a meeting and you're just like, oh, I need your cell phone number. And you just text them, right? Because they made a good comment. Or you're like, have you ever thought about yourself as a leader? Because someone may never have said that to them before because they don't look the way we think a leader looks. They don't speak the way we think a leader think, speaks. But they're leading. And they're showing up for their community. And part of it becomes our responsibility to really kind of key into that a little bit more and to, to, to expand and share. Well, thank you guys both so much um, for joining us today. This has been fascinating. Um, so um, we're going to have a video to everyone participating. Yes, that's my daughter. <laughs> um, so that's Penelope making her little uh, webinar debut. Um, so we will have a video of this session available up online. Um, and also everyone who's in attendance today, please keep an eye out for your email. We are going to be also sending out an email um, that will also have a link to that video. Um, so thank you both Stephanie and Allie for all your insights. It's been fascinating and wonderful. And um, thank you to everyone who attended. Thank you so much, Preservation Marilyn. Yes, indeed. Thank you so much. And to everyone who spent, you know, the last hour, almost hour and a half with us. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>